Bonjour, bonjour à tous. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank, welcome to this uh, second discussion to our 2022 Country Risk Conference with COFAS. We're very happy to have you on behalf of BFM Business. We're very happy to be partners in this very beautiful event. How can transition towards uh, more sustainable economic models is affecting economies and companies? This is our topic, a very uh, interesting topic and with me in order to analyze uh, to talk about this uh, topic we have Valerie Kinuramis uh, thank you for being with us uh, you are executive director for perspective and research at ADEM the environment and energy control agency Mireille Chirole Assouline uh, welcome you are professor of economics at the Paris School of Economics and at the University Panthéon Sorbonne and with economists we need company management managers uh, so that we go into the nitty-gritty and in the uh, material consequences of this uh, very spectacular transition. Thank you, Geoffrey Boucault, for being with us. Uh, you are R&D and Strategy Director at Valeo, and at least we can say that Valeo in the world of automobile today, many things are taking place. Uh, we are in line with Denis Ferrand as well. Hello. You are General Manager of Rexicode, CEO of Rexicode. Thank you for being with us today. The least we can say is that this uh, transition is a spectacular one. It is necessary. It is moving forward in a rather heterogeneous way, depending on sectors, countries, environments. And behind these general words, uh, there are many different realities. Mireille Chirol Azuline, this transition corresponds to what type of realities if we were to define it in a general way? What could we say? Transition is both ecological and a matter of energy. It is switching from a traditional production mode to new production mode that integrates the uh, production impacts on the common good. And this is not necessarily an objective that had been integrated by all corporates uh, in the past. In fact, it is the result of a trend that uh, started out decades ago, but it has been formalized at the beginning of the year 2000 in France and in Europe. It is what we call a CSR, a Corporate Social Responsibility. And I'd like to uh, say that we need to add another S, another E. It's, in fact, the social, societal, and environmental responsibility of companies. Um, you know, this change in the, the production activities is, has become tangible since more and more companies claim to be responsible. Doing so is the result uh, of a, a proactive approach and autonomous approach of some companies. But quite often, it is also the result of a certain number of obligations. Uh, the main of these obligations is, is the need to report, to make something public about, about their very level of responsibility. So it has implied the uh, issuance of CSR reports, or now it is about extra financial performance as well. And a certain number of companies now go way beyond uh, these criteria and present themselves as companies with a purpose, that purpose being to uh, contribute to the common good. And uh, promoting oneself as such is much more stringent uh, for companies. It, uh, it implies a, a lot more constraints. There are still few of these companies and I could refer to the observatory of, of such uh, companies. There are only 504 companies with a purpose, but that implies a, a steering committee or a monitoring committee or a certifying uh, uh, agency focusing on these constraints. Can we say that after this process, and we understood that we were just at the beginning of it and that it is an heterogeneous one, and as you explained, nobody is moving forward at the same pace, but we would have sailed through a phenomenon that, given its uh, scope, would be the equivalent of an industrial revolution. Well, uh, uh, most probably that would lead us to a re uh, revolution. The industrial revolution at the end of the 18th century has been induced by the fact that we have had access to a certain number of uh, energies. 
in, in, in the, the, the widespread manner, if you like, that was affordable, energy that was affordable, that allowed for the development of a lot of production activities that were not possible before. So now we are evolving towards a transition with new supply modes and a certain number of activities that boomed really during the, the, the previous decades will now have to evolve, to transform. That, that truly is a transformation. It's not a transformation toward digital technologies, but it's more transformation in terms of products and services. Denis Ferrand, General Manager of Rexacode, you carried out with the French Public Investment Bank a survey with 650 French SMEs and you studied this transition phenomenon. What are the conclusions? Well, I'd like to concur with what's been said about the fact that people uh, now embrace environmental issues. At BPI, we've seen acceleration in the awareness of the fact that sustainability is now of the essence. Pre-COVID, 20 to 25% of uh, SMEs and mid-caps uh, believe that the environment was among the objectives, you see. Now it's uh, up to one-third, so there's been a shift, you see. So there have been inroads achieved by this way of thinking. You know, it's a citizen's approach, but it's also the result of the awareness of the need to act on the CSR front. As we hopefully move out of the COVID uh, pandemic, there are constraints that bear upon supply and the labor market as well. So now, applicants want to be on the same page as the company that would hire them in terms of values and approaches. Let me give you an example based on uh, the concept of sustainable development. But let's take the French uh, nursing home company Orpea. You see, of course, non-financial uh, criteria uh, were pretty good at Orpea, but <laughs> There, uh, in, ad in addition to financial. Sorry to interrupt you. One of the shareholders is thus asking to adopt a status of a company with a purpose. And this is the evidence that uh, there is a meaning in all this history. Yes, absolutely. But what's interesting here is that pressure is exerted on companies now. And from greenwashing, there's a fine line between greenwashing and green bashing. You see, because sustainable policies are not necessarily uh, developed, but they are increasingly so. It's, uh, companies have to be consistent between uh, the, the, the talk and the walk. They have to talk the talk and walk the walk more and more. Demand is here, intention is here, the need is here, necessity to recruit, as you said, Denis Ferrand, and these are testimonials that we receive every day. It's really striking to, to see this. We receive a lot of business managers at BFM Business. Ten years ago, when you were recruiting people, they were asking for salary levels and then their career development. And today, systematically, in all recruiting interviews, there are questions about values and the commitment of the company towards a sustainable development model. Geoffrey Bucco, this transition, this is your daily bread, and it is the topic of the time for Valeo that is announcing a new adventure with Renault. You will be building a new type of electric model. Valeo, a few figures, 17 billion euros in revenues, more than 100,000 uh, 100, uh, employees in 30 countries. Concretely speaking, this transition in your daily life, uh, how do you manage it? Well, it's, it's the result of a long-term strategy. As we said earlier on, certain companies such as Valio committed themselves to this transition a few years ago. I remember what Jacques Achenbois, uh, our CEO, said 13 years ago, and he said tomorrow's fight will be reducing CO2 emissions. So obviously today it's self-evident, and we're probably going to talk about it today. So 
The idea was to align all of the product policies at Valio to ensure that mobility would be both more sustainable and more secure. So we have 20,000 researchers and engineers at Valio throughout the world, and so they work on technologies which aim at accelerating mobility under you know all its forms, but, but, but greener and more sustainable mobility. So this is what drives us today. And I agree with what you said. When we hire now, and we hire a lot throughout the world, and this is typically something that, that we discuss right away with, 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 uh, with uh, uh, applicants, you know, they ask us, what do you do concretely? And what do we do concretely? Well, we've just announced a strategic partnership with the Renault company to develop the EESM motor. It's an electric uh, motor to basically do without rare earth to uh, build an efficient electric motor, which I hope we will find in, in many Renault cars and other uh, cars as well, of other makes as well. So that's part of what we do at the moment. And clearly we are at a moment of acceleration at Valeo. We've just announced the integration of our joint venture with Siemens. So clearly, at this point, 100% uh, of the Valio Siemens company uh, will join the Valio company, and we are absorbing it, and it's going to become uh, a major player in electric propulsion throughout the world. Valérie Quignot Ramos, the process, the method is important, and you at ADEM developed a method to help companies defining and implementing decarbonization strategies of their activities. What can you tell about this tool? How does it work? How can we use it? Absolutely. Let me start by reminding you that uh, as a government agency, the ADEMA, or Agency for the Environment and Energy Management, shares its expertise with different uh, players, the general public, local and regional authorities, and large corporates. It is really important for every stakeholder to work together so as to embrace the environmental transition. And that is our main priority. We support corporates, companies that may be lagging behind a little bit. We give them hands-on tools to help them decarbonize their activities, reduce the carbon footprint of their activities. So we have a tool, or rather a methodology called ACT, for accessing the low carbon transition, ALCT. And since 2015, this tool has been used by companies to set targets for themselves, targets in terms of reducing their greenhouse gas emissions, over the short, medium, and long term. But mostly, we help them design a corporate strategy with targeted investments and well-identified drivers for decarbonization so they can embrace that environmental transition. In addition, there's a process of verification. In other words, whatever announcements that make have to be verified. Otherwise, there's a risk of greenwashing. So so it is important to benchmark what you do, compare yourself with the competition, and there are initiatives that are part of a project that I can tell you more about in a minute. It's a platform, a climate transparency platform. It's a rating platform, a platform that helps you compare the ratings. So as far as ALCT is concerned, for automotive, this is an opportunity to assess decarbonization propositions for a particular estate or fleet. So who are your main users at this point? Well, ALCT covers 15 industrial sectors, from automotive to oil and gas, the cement sector as well. We actually worked with cement makers on a sector-based transition plan. So we work on the ground with stakeholders on the ground to actually identify what kind of technologies have to be rolled out, what kind of investments must be made, what are the labor ramifications, the employment repercussions. So this involves public sector and private sector players. We were talking about cement. Uh, it is a very good example of the fact that 
that uh, we are not under the same roof when uh, carrying out this transition. There are polluting industries starting from very far, and they have a huge work to carry out. Cement industry, all the uh, uh, energy producers, in the classic meaning of the word. Would you say that the most polluting industries today understood this need of a transition and start working on it seriously? Well, I would say yes, they, they understood, but because they were, they were threatened, well, it's not a natural threat, but the, the prospect of uh, seeing a, a scheme, common law... Uh, There's a fear of the policemen. Well, the fear of the, of the carbon pricing, yes. Um, you were referring to the cement sector, but the steel, glass industries as well, you know, all these sectors are really polluting with a huge uh, international competition. So they enjoyed a, a system uh, with a free quotas that were given to them on the European market for uh, negotiable uh, uh, emission quotas. So these free quotas represented prote protection for these industries, but in a way, uh, for a while at least, um, these industries believed that their business was polluting. Right, that was a fact. So we had to cope with this, you know. But increasingly, we're now considering setting up a, a carbon tax, carbon inclusion mechanism in Europe. Um, and this should go hand in hand with the gradual removal of these free quotas. Therefore, European industries, the cement, the steel industries, and so on and so forth, will have to make exactly the same efforts as, as uh, what foreign competitors should do themselves. And they will have a, a subject to a, a carbon price. Uh, recently, we've seen the advent of innovative industrial uh, projects. Uh, ArcelorMittal, for instance, uh, that uh, has uh, opened a production uh, unit or invested in a production unit for decarbonized steel. There are also other projects that are being implemented uh, for green cement, for instance, um, with French companies. So, here and there we see that there are efforts that are made. Uh, now, uh, just to conclude on, on that particular point, you know, the oil companies, for instance. Well, all, we see the example, you know, in France, a big oil company that is diversifying, that diversifies its activities, is exactly the same, you know, in a way. Uh, all companies, traditional business may not be possible anymore in, in a few decades from now. And, and, and understanding this is the way for companies to diversify their business. That's the goal. Is this going too rapidly? We hear some company managers saying so. Some in the automotive sectors, I have in mind the interview that some weeks ago Carlos Tavares granted to uh, Les Eco. A newspaper, and he's saying that uh, the calendar for transition imposed to the automotive industry and to the suppliers is too quick. It is not allowing reconversion of the industrial tools and will lead to serious difficulties. And this is what he is saying and what company managers are saying. And this could have also a big social impact on employment. So from your opinion, is this transition and the one imposed to your sector, that of the automotive industry, we understood the meaning of history, we understood it is necessary, but are you being asked too much, too rapidly? Well, part of what we do is, you know, about developing technologies and bringing them in time to comply with new regulations. And the new regulation, it is established at the European level. 
it's um, it's the same thing in China. I mean, and the same thing in, in the U.S. since Biden uh, um, took over. So electrification has started. Now we have to develop these technologies in time for them to be sort of integrated into the vehicles that will be sold in 2030, 2035. So our job is not necessarily to, you know, say anything about this. So you're saying we don't have a choice, we have to do with what we have. Well, obviously, this this is a legal requirement, and what we have to do is to develop technologies to meet those, those you know, to comply with those requirements. So this is what we have to do as fast as possible. You know, rapidity obviously comes from the law, but also... Uh, we are seeing a lot of new technologies develop very quickly, quicklier and quicklier, actually. So this, this is the world that we live in. We are a technology company. This is how, how we see ourselves. So what really drives us is, you know, to act fast and decisively. So we have a framework, you know, we have a direction. The, the course has been set. We have a, a European roadmap, more or less. So we have to, to, to stay in it. The so-called Fit for 55 roadmap, basically, and we have to increase by 55% the CO2 emissions to lower it to 40 grams. So this gives us an idea of what automotive mobility should look like in the near future. So what we do on, on our end is that in terms of mobility, I mean, it, it encompasses cars, but uh, not just that. I mean, we need to understand overall how people are going to move about tomorrow morning, uh, tomorrow at, at what cost, you know. So uh, our position basically is to, to understand what are the technological factors that will enable the best mobility at the best price. And so this is why we are looking at um, electric motors, not just for, you know, uh, personal cars, but also the so-called electric tuk-tuk in India, which is booming. Um, we uh, have uh, partnerships with major companies uh, who are really, again, booming there with these new forms of mobilities, more sustainable mobility. Um, in France, for instance, well, we're very proud because it's made in France. This, uh, the Ami car, it's it's a small urban vehicle. It's, it's a fully electric vehicle. So, again, what we're about is finding technologies that will sustain and underpin this, this uh, transition. Denis Ferrand, it, as we're saying, this is a rapid transition, but it has a cost. It means all the investments that are to be made in order to develop the new tools that we need, but all the processes and tools that we are abandoning, that we are no longer using, this is what we call the stranded costs. And these are huge, really. Have we really understood this dimension of transition today? Well, you're right. When it comes to cost, you tend to focus on new investments, and the investments are indeed substantial. McKinsey uh, released a survey showing $9 trillion a year. That's the investments that are necessary uh, by 2050. Uh, in terms of all kinds of factors, so an additional $3.5 trillion a year. We looked at the investment needs uh, moving forward, and we estimate anywhere between eight, 75 and 85 billion uh, euros per year, in addition to what is already invested in order to reach zero net emissions by 2050. So you see, we're looking at 2.8 to 4 of points of GDP, which is less than the cost of not decarbonization, you see, because that cost is very substantial indeed. So anyway, so it, that's one notion of investment. But there's another aspect that you flagged. It has to do with these uh, costs that are significant in terms of the fact that you've, say, invested in uh, tangible assets that you will no longer be available to uh, amortize as planned because there, this collides with new regulations. Therefore, you have to write off a loss because you haven't uh, written off your uh, tangible asset. So you see, it encroaches upon your equity. So 
financing that, financing transition, financing the transition to um, sustainable development is something that's done at the top of the balance sheet. The same McKinsey report that gave you this number I showed, trillions of dollars by 2050, given the acceleration of transition. Well, we're also going to have to find ways of raising capital to make all these investments possible. The Germans, for instance, decided to relinquish coal and to have an offset of 4 billion euros per plant shutdown for the companies concerned. Because with the situation of public finance, say, in France, for instance, the issue is uh, soon going to emerge. But you have to look at the nature of the financing that will be required. Those companies that you are counseling, do they integrate this approach? Do they have it in mind when managing the transition? Or is it part of the methods and topics on which you draw your attention? Because they do not necessarily have it this dimension in mind. Yes. Earlier, I referenced the sector-based transition plans. We are faced with technological challenges. And that's really our core business back at ADEME. We're a bunch of engineers. But in addition to the technology challenges, there's a the issue of financing. What kind of funds can we or should we earmark for such technologies? And as I said before, there are labor ramifications, uh, action plans that are part of public policy. So against this uh, backdrop, and also against the backdrop of the European Union, over two years ago now, we suggested a project which is receiving EU funds. It's called Finance Climate Act. Um, the goal is to make sure that climate change is placed at the core of the financial system because it is the financial system that is going to help corporates make the necessary investments to transform themselves. Geoffrey Boucault, this stranded cost, how can they be integrated into this transition of the tool? Is it part of your concerns? Could you tell us how you manage them? Can you give a figure of them? Well, our role is to take risks and to try to look as far into the future as possible. So we need a, you know, to have a 15-year sort of timeline to try and understand what will happen. This should give us the time to transform what needs to be transformed. At Valeo, um, you might know that, you know, well, obviously, uh, a lot of what we're currently doing is due to the diesel crisis. That was a major trigger, if you will. Valio was not particularly exposed in terms of its products to this very strong legacy, which is also a you know a stranded cost due to 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 the diesel model. So we are you know steering our product policy uh, to do just that. We are in constant dialogue with uh, lawmakers and with authorities, and so to to sort of try and, and anticipate what will come next. Uh, we very often often redraw our long-term plans, but to, you know, operate in, a, in an ever-changing world. So really, the, our, the, our best protection would be uh, how fast we know how to move. You know, we need to move fast in order to anticipate how we can best transform ourselves at this point. Mireille Charolle, this transition, is it easy to fund? There are many systems, but overall, is finance, the banks, all institutions supporting companies, are they really playing the game of this transition? Well, funding, you know, funds go where profitability is anticipated. You know, there's no mystery about it. Uh, the bank's activities is regulated with a certain number of, of obligations they have to fulfill. It's same for banks and, and other uh, market players. And therefore, they have to explain what is the uh, share of climate risk in their investments and what is the share of their uh, investments 
investments that will have a, a positive impact on climate. Uh, socially responsible investments is, is increasing. Yes, indeed. It is starting. But it's, you know, but there was very little at the beginning. So uh, when we take a look at the figures in term, and if we compare with the need for funding, the uh, climate finance is is less than, you know, it, it's uh, less than 800 billion euros. You know, it's, it's nothing uh, if you compare with the actual need for funds. So, you know, it's, in fact, it is the anticipated profitability that will help finance support businesses that can remain profitable. And, you know, you were talking about uh, 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 assets, uh, uh, stranded assets. The, the, the problem is, is anticipation, you know. Uh, automotive manufacturers that kept on investing in diesel when, you know, there had been a discussion for a year about the tax incentive that had to be removed. And it it is actually happening. All these automotive companies uh, failed in their anticipation. So whether our old companies are still are uh, funding new projects for uh, new operation uh, oil projects, it is a lack of anticipation indeed. So believing that this problem could be solved just by m making up uh, for these uh, uh, stranded costs, it, it is a problem of moral hazard, you know. There is no incentive for people, for companies to be careful because and then there will be compensation afterwards. So we have a problem here. And what I believe is uh, that banks and financial players will have to fund decarbonizations at these projects uh, appear profitable. And if they are profitable, it means that other projects are not profitable anymore. And to me, this goes hand in hand with other measures like uh, carbon pricing. Denis Ferrand, is there a Europe of transition or is it each to everyone? Well, Europe is uh, sort of forming. The 55 is uh, evidence of that. Europe uh, is, you know, producing regulations. And when it comes to regulations, let me make an important addition. For foreseeability of regulations matters. Take a look at energy, for instance. Of course, one may wonder about uh, what is going on in the minds of producers, but you also have energy users. And now there's a very quick shift from the reduction in uh, CO2 emission quotas. Initially, they were supposed to be cut by 40% by 2030. It's going to be 55% uh, reduction by 2030. The consequence is a very significant acceleration in the price of CO2 quotas, so much so that today, I don't want to be too wordy here, but so much so that today, the price of CO2 quotas is 60, well, 62% of the cost of electricity uh, and 16% for a a uh, gas plant. The former one was a coal plant. So you see, there is a consequence, and one of the contributing factors to the price of electricity, and electricity has become very costly for uh, companies because they are the users, and they don't uh, necessarily have the luxury of making a, an energy choice. They just take whatever comes. And now the cost structure is being distorted, and it uh, rattles their uh, uh, comfort, you see. So the role of Europe is regulatory first and foremost, and uh, the uh, European scale is the right scale, but foreseeability of regulations is necessary, and uh, things should not be too sudden, and anticipation has to be possible, because there could be impediments to deploying investments in companies that use energy, electricity, you see, and it can lead to cash problems and even uh, uh, defaults, so it's all about the role of the European Union when it comes to uh, uh, rules governing access to the market uh, and so on. But the European Union's role is important in terms of helping companies understand that access to market is subjected to uh, precise environmental rules. We want back to the other participants to react. But by listening to you, there is, however, one question. Are we not facing 
a, a, a wall for transition. The wall is that of infrastructures. The, this is the debate on the recovery, the, 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 the impetus given to the nuclear energy in France. With this transition, we are going towards a massive increase in electricity consumption. We have to reinvent the production model of it not to, to avoid a considerable emission of carbon, and we're far from it. We have an aging nuclear industry in France. Investments will be considerable and will require years, decades, before they can produce the energy we need. So this question around infrastructures and the organization of our energy production, isn't it a huge hindrance to our transition? Well, just to uh, refer to uh, uh, what another speaker said, well, these obstacles, this, this hindrance, you know, when you're facing a wall, that's the way to move forward, to innovate. And innovation should have been anticipated as well, you know. Infrastructure is missing. But I'm not convinced that uh, uh, focusing on a, on a nuclear solution is the best way to rapidly produce the right quantity of energy that is required. Um, the development of renewable energies and the storage of electricity, for instance, you know, searching for technology that would allow for such a storage, you know, relying on, on batteries, for instance, at a very large scale, uh, infrastructure that could be shared for uh, electricity production, wherever it is project, that's the solution for the future, you know. Uh, I believe, well, it, we should rather uh, not believe that an uh, obstacle will prevent us from moving forward. We should see this as a, an incentive. It may mean many different things. We have incredible startups that we receive every day at BFM Business. Some were saying that producing nuclear energy by collecting nuclear waste and used in other technology for electricity. This morning, we had guests telling us how we can develop a technology of micro local nuclear power plant without having to build the next EPR. Valérie Kinyu Ramos, are you concerned with all these questions concerning our capacity to produce in order to operate this transition? Is it a concern? Mm, yes. But also, we are determined to turn the question on its head. To our mind, uh, nothing is written in stone. We don't necessarily think that uh, power consumption or electricity consumption is going to grow. We need to rethink our own power usage and also how much room we give to sobriety, energy sobriety within society. If I can just talk about that for a second. Um, by sobriety, we often think, okay, I'm going to need to tighten my belt. I need to make sacrifices. Not necessarily. I think what people must do, society must do, is uh, uh, rethink their actual needs and so that power consumption can be more sustainable. Now, in terms of the 2050 transition, ADEME made that publication at the end of November, and uh, at the end of March, we will supplement that with a macroeconomic analysis, and there are four potential trajectories. And via these four trajectories, we analyze the pros and cons. What can we do, or sh what should we do? to make sure we streamline energy consumption? Should we alter lifestyles or technology? Maybe find the right balance between the two? And at least in France, how do we achieve carbon neutrality? How do we maintain a, a pleasant lifestyle while reducing our energy usage? through innovation, innovating through technologies, of course, but also by being more reasonable and uh, using less electricity. Geoffrey Boucault, how can an industry facing this increase 
in electricity prices, of energy, generally speaking, that is impacting you, of course. Is this having an impact on your capacity to carry out this transition and speeding up the transition? If I may, before that, just one word about infrastructure to, to echo what's been said. And the question is connected. This is obviously something that, that we're scrutinizing um, for electric cars, especially. And th this brings me back to the need for planning, you know, planification. But once again, you have to take into account national regulations and, and you have to develop infrastructure and, and develop public-private partnership in this transition. And this is exactly what we're doing uh, across the automotive industry and with the French state. How many uh, charging terminals? So where should they be? Yes, obviously, uh, because uh, if you have an electric car but cannot charge it up, it's going to be pretty difficult. So um, I'm not saying that every day I, I make a tally of all the charging terminals that there are throughout the world, but almost, you know, we want to make sure that uh, there is a, a pro progress. You know, we want 100,000 uh, terminals. Given the needs, which is not a big one, but an electric car today, you can't easily charge it on the motorway when you want to drive from Paris to Marseille. We clearly need more of those, clearly. But, uh, you know, lagging behind by a few months, I mean, it's not that, that, that big of a problem. And, but... Again, if we want 30% of all cars in 2030 in the world to, to, to be powered by batteries, well, and that's the outcome of the current regulation, so they need charging up, you know. We're not talking about 100,000 terminals. We're talking about millions of terminals and infrastructure, you know, pieces of infrastructure that have to be funded after, you know, establishing who needs to pay, you know. Hence the question of a public-private partnership. So your answer is both. Yes, both. And this also should open up opportunities for industrial players. Uh, we, as a company, uh, this... This was last September, we announced and we presented our very first uh, electric uh, terminal. So, because intrinsically, what is it? I mean, it's a piece of electronic equipment which is very close to the uh, embarked or, or, or embedded electronic equipment on a car. So, you just integrate that into another infrastructure. And this is also a piece of equipment that uh, entertains a dialogue with, uh, uh, for instance, microgrids. I, this is something I believe in a lot. And there should be a sort of a participatory collaborative approach to the management of, of the grid and, and energy. So basically, what we've done is we've manufactured electric terminals that can allow you to charge up at night, but in different ways. Some consumers will want to maximize, you know, to do it as fast as possible, basically. Others will rather want to do it as cheaply as possible or as sustainably as possible, you know. So, it, it you know, then you have different charging up strategies that uh, you can establish in a dialogue with the grid. So, for instance, a car could even unload power onto the grid at night and then charge up during the day, you know. So to come back to what you were saying, it's not just an individual choice, it's a collaborative choice. It's The question here is the users of the products you're manufacturing. My initial question was on those who supply energy to your industrial tool. And my question was, given the various difficulties that we experience today and questions about infrastructure, is it for you? A, a concern. First, prices are increasing and you will have to accept these. But in the medium term, is this a concern for you about your capacity to get energy and essentially in decarbonized energy and this at a competitive price so that you can operate your industry. This really lies at the heart of our plan. Over the last year, we've started to report on these questions with extra financial criteria. You, you, you've alluded to it earlier on, but uh, our objective is to decrease our total scope emissions by 45 percent 
by 2030 to reach carbon neutrality in 2050. So this will require a major effort in, in, the, in the energy that we use. You know, the best energy is the one that you don't use, as we were just saying, you know. So we're basically looking, you know, throughout the 180 facilities, uh, producing facilities for the group, how we can decrease the consumption, especially in the, uh, you know, production units. So this requires investment. So we've announced a four million, uh, 400 million euro investment over uh, the next 10 years. So it's it's an addition of, of, of small concrete actions, you know, changing to LED light and LED lighting, uh, to uh, energy saving devices. We're going to um, modify certain um, ovens or, or kilns in our production lines. So, 400 million euros uh, over the next years so, um, that we will spend progressively. We're not going to wait until the very end of this, of this moment. So, we want to scatter that in time. And we want to be able to reduce our consumption as much as possible. And since we also want to grow a lot, we need the energy to do that. So, to go back to your question, how do we do to buy green energy? And to me, this requires planning. You know, the same thing. So we are currently planning for 80% um, of our energy that will be green energy by 2030. That's that's our end goal by 2030. In uh, uh, you know, in in the countries and areas where this type of, of energy coverage, if if you will, is possible. So. These plants that we have depend on greater stability on the private side, but also on the public side. And we need legal certainty also from that standpoint. We don't have much time left. And to conclude, I would ask each and every one of you two to react. I want to, be, I want to play the devil's advocate. We agree to say that this transition is necessary, is virtuous and desired because it is going towards a more efficient production method in order to preserve our environment but and conserve our environment but during this transition maybe there is a risk to be too good if we have a rapid transition and you've just given one example and mentioned figures of massive investments those who invest less rapidly than us will operate this transition not as rapidly as us and thus will have lower production uh, costs in the meantime. Wouldn't this be a competitive edge compared to the good pupils who would invest more rapidly? Well, if you go 30 years back, well, now uh, we've changed policies. Now we look at environmental concerns first. We don't want free riders, you know, people who uh, use uh, the technology once the cost of development have been uh, paid by uh, others. It's a global playing field. Of course, there's no global authority. It would be complicated to consider uh, 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 developing one. But we have to try to have a level playing field in that regard. We have to make sure that uh, regulations and policies uh, embark as many players as possible. And the European Union has a role to play. Is there a real risk? Yes, there is a risk. But I would like to wrap up by circling back to what you said. You were you referenced the transition. But what kind of transition are we talking about? For you, for me, what kind of transition are we embracing? Taking, for example, the charging stations for electric cars, electric mobility solutions, yes, those charging stations are necessary, but to what extent? Can we imagine, for example, that you will use an electric car uh, to travel cross-country from Paris to Marseille, which means that you need a certain number of charging stations all along the way, but what about piggybacking on rail, using other mobility solutions. So you need to find the right balance between those different strengths and modes of transportation. It's important to discuss that balance and the relative roles and obligations of each 
operator, it's important within our country, but also at the European level and also in the rest of the world. I, I, I believe that we all have our own way of thinking about the transition and what it means. More than the risk of the free riders. The four scenarios that we suggest and also the other scenarios in terms of RTE and whatnot, um, I do believe that this is future thought. I do believe this is something we need to discuss and what we need is to set up programs at the national level. We need to organize things so as to make sure that uh, economic stakeholders have the visibility that they need for their business plans. So, not where competitors are not as good and could get an induced advantage. Is this a concern for you? Are you monitoring this? We are monitoring this and we need to do this as, as uh, precise a way as possible. But we are constantly looking for, this is what someone was saying earlier on, constantly looking for new talents throughout the world. And constantly uh, we have to, you know, promote our projects for people to to jump on our bandwagon. So uh, this is part of what we have to do. So we need to convince people to bring them on to generate the necessary energy to develop these technologies day in, day out. I think this is what is most important for me. The concluding word, Mireille, Chiro, Asseline. Is this transition going in the right direction? Are you optimistic? Well, in the medium term, I am optimistic. Um, I fear that we will not be able to proceed with it uh, quickly enough, and perhaps not as quick as what it is actually desired and expected. Uh, but all these measures, European measures, should allow, at least for uh, Europe, to develop what is required to move on. And I also believe that technological progress is the best asset. Even in the short term, there can be uh, disappointments, but by anticipating on innovation, we will win this transition. Positive message to conclude this panel discussion. Thank you for your participation. Thank you to our listeners and see you soon.